kind of exactly where Convene lives, only on a great international place. So I'm going to introduce them, but first I want to say greetings from Convene and introduce uh, our community. Uh, today, Convene has 500 CEOs that are working together, uh, encouraging one another to become greater leaders, to propel each other towards industry leading performance and purpose. If that's something new to you and you'd like to talk about that, please uh, reach out through our website and we'd love to have a conversation with you because we believe that life happens in community. Uh, we call it life on life over time with truth. Life is the life of a Christian business owner, CEO. Truth is God's word and he will be glorified. So today I get to introduce Hope International, which is uh, an awesome group of individuals that uh, do microfinancing, which is such a uh, just amazing opportunity to lift people into their giftedness uh, by using dollars to help people develop their entrepreneurship, uh, to develop opportunity, uh, to develop uh, avenues to love people in an amazing way. So Peter Greer here today, Chris Horst, and they're going to talk about entrepreneurship for human flourishing. So I I get to turn it over to them, but first I'm going to just uh, let you know that there is a Q&A opportunity for you. There's an icon at the bottom of your screen, and please use that, and we will record this. It will be available to you, and we just hope that this blesses you on your journey as, uh, as we all serve our Lord and Savior. So, Peter, Chris, good morning. Thank you for investing in us. Well, thanks so much, Mark. Thanks for having us. We uh, love Convene. Our founder is a Convene member. Uh, both Chris and I have participated and uh, just really been impacted by the incredible work uh, that you're doing. So thanks for allowing us to spend this time. And, and this is a topic that I hope resonates uh, with a lot of Convene members. It's something that Chris and I have been thinking about. It's something that we wrote uh, a, a small book on, and uh, it's a topic that we care about a lot. But this topic of entrepreneurship for human flourishing. A couple of years ago, I was asked uh, to go to a college, uh, and I was asked to have a debate, um, a debate with Shane Claiborne. And I don't know if you know Shane Claiborne, but uh, he is uh, an individual who's written many books uh, on college campuses. He is widely known. He, his first book, The Irresistible Revolution, uh, just seemed to permeate uh, college campuses. And, and the call was really clear. It was, we've got to move We've got to move to action. Uh, followers of Jesus have been in the background for too long. We've got to move. We've got to do something. And, and so we were brought on college campuses, uh, and we've now done this a couple times. Uh, one time, uh, CNN actually covered the story, and this was actually the, the picture, if you're able to see it here, was on the homepage of CNN that kind of picked it up. And their summary of our conversation uh, was, Jesus a communist or a capitalist? Um, that's, that, in my mind, uh, is not um, quite as interesting a conversation. Jesus was Savior, uh, full stop, period. Um, I think the question that Shane and I, and perhaps some of the convened members, or maybe some of your kids, uh, the question that we are thinking about is not should we be communist or capitalist, but what really is the most effective way to care for individuals? So those of us that have experienced the grace of Jesus, that want to go into the places, want to today to go to the widow, to the orphan, to the vulnerable, to the foreigner. What does it look like for us today to love and serve our neighbors? And it's been really interesting that this conversation, at least on college campuses, is one that is dominated today by this idea that if you care about the poor, you are going to have a really small model of response. And, and it's almost like a few years ago, uh, perhaps, there still is this thinking, but if you really love Jesus, then you are going to be a missionary. And if you love Jesus a lot, but not quite as much, then you're going to be a pastor. And, and, and in a similar way, the, the message that is being communicated today is if you want to care for individuals that are in need, you are going to go and you're going to practice a radical sense of redistribution. And so Shane has given a lot away. He has sold his possessions, and he does live in community, and there's some really beautiful aspects of that. But this idea that if you love Jesus, there is a small way that you can respond 
And I love at Convene, and, and I love that the work that we get to do at Hope International is we want to have a bigger conversation than that. We want to say it is absolutely possible to love Jesus and be a pastor, but it also is possible to love Jesus and be leading a Fortune 500 company. And it also is possible to care for the poor by going and living in a place of poverty alongside our brothers and sisters. And it also is possible to love Jesus and be in the halls of power and influence. And so we want to have a broader conversation. And this idea of entrepreneurship, I think Chris and I really have a passion for this because in some ways we kind of we're in, the middle, we're in the middle ground. We work for Hope International. And so our day job is to go into places of poverty and to help individuals work their way out of poverty. And, and so some people you know, like us because we are caring for, for the vulnerable in, in the margins of the world. And yet the way that we do it is a way that we're convinced is so different than the majority of the approaches that churches and charities and individuals have of going into communities, seeing what stuff they don't have, and giving it away. And so for me, just a few days ago, last week, I was, I was in a community. It was a Haitian Bate community in the Dominican Republic. And again, I was just reminded in this community, what really makes a difference? What do we do? Because I, again, I, I agree with Shane, and, and I really believe that there is this unbroken chain of individuals that have committed their life to Christ and said, we want to care in words and in deeds for the most vulnerable of the world. And so I was in this community and just reminded again of this question of what do we actually do? And so we've had this privilege of entering into homes, of having our hearts broken. And, and yet I think the conclusions that we've come to internationally have a lot of relevance for all of us, whether you're working in a business here in the U.S. or whether you're an entrepreneur starting a small enterprise in a Haitian Bate uh, community. And so as we go in, the first thing that I've become convinced of is that we've got to understand the problem. What is the problem that we're trying to solve? And there are a lot of people that have been writing about this increasing dissatisfaction of just a material definition of poverty. Individuals say, if we can just give enough stuff away, then we can eradicate poverty. That has never and will never work. And it's not just because clothes wear out and food is eaten. It's not just because houses that once looked beautiful fall into disrepair. It's also because poverty is more than just this issue of finances. There was a study that was done by the World Bank and 60,000 individuals were asked to define poverty. And in places of financial poverty, the words that they used to describe the problem were not necessarily material. They talked about shame, they talked about feeling dirty, feeling voiceless, feeling powerless, feeling helpless, feeling hopeless. All of those things cannot be cured by someone coming in with a massive plan of redistribution. So we think about the problem a little differently. We want to be people that, yes, spend ourselves. We want to spend ourselves. We want to be at a spot where we have nothing left. We want to spend ourselves on behalf of the hungry. As Isaiah writes, we want to satisfy the needs of the oppressed. And what a beautiful promise. Wouldn't it be great in our world if our light would rise in the darkness and your night will become like the noonday? This is what the world needs to see. Authentic followers of Jesus that are spending themselves on the hungry are satisfying the needs of the oppressed, but are using all of the tools available to do that. So again, the problem that we believe we're trying to focus on, we believe poverty is not just material. And we know this from reading in scripture. We know this from the beginning pages of our Bible. This is from Bryant Myers, this sort of paradigm. But this idea that in the opening pages of scripture, we see that there are multiple dimensions of poverty. There's, there's spiritual poverty. Our relationship with God is broken. There's social poverty. Our relationship with each other is broken. There's personal poverty. We feel more helpless, more hopeless. And yes, there is material poverty. So these are the four domains that we look at. And again, we believe in a unique way that entrepreneurs have been on the sidelines. Kingdom-centered, Christ-centered entrepreneurs have been on the sidelines. And yet the tools that we have, both here and around the world, might be tools that can address these four domains of poverty. And so I just wanted to share a few words from some of the people that we serve. And I wish we could do this in kind of a, a little game here, matching game. Um, but uh, the way that, that, that it is, is I just want to read a simple quote from an entrepreneur that we've served. 
and, and to listen to the quote and say, which aspect of poverty has this case study of entrepreneurship addressed? So I hope that makes sense. But the first one, again, I was just in the Dominican Republic and met Valentin. And Valentin said this, he said, I've expanded from three to 32 hives. He was so proud about this. It was great because he had this smoker. And he said, don't worry, because the smoke pacifies the bees. But it was pretty tough because he was the only one who had the smoker. And so bees were around the rest of us as we were kind of walking behind him. The bees were not pacified. But there was so much pride. So this is an example of the material impact. He's gone from three to 32 hives. He's been able to mass produce honey. He's been able to wholesale it. And he's been able to have a significant impact on his ability as a dad to take care of his kids. So there's a material impact of entrepreneurship. Second, this is from Apte Digna. I was with her in the Philippines and, and uh, she has started this laundry business and her business has grown. She's been able to take on additional clients. Um, there's a, a growing kind of hostel, um, hospitality business where she lives and she's been able to do the laundry for them and she said this when blessings come my way I want to share them she's been able to employ 44 women and so Ate Digna this is an example yes of the material but it's beyond that it's also the social impact she is reaching out and sharing with her community next one Moise had everything destroyed uh, by rebels in Congo and his comment was this he said little by little with the Lord's help I'll get there as someone who was uh, a little bit further in his, um, in his journey to have everything destroyed and to have to start over, I cannot imagine what that would be like. And yet Moise said, little by little, with the Lord's help, I'll get there. So again, I wish I could ask you, what's that an example of? But I think that's the personal. That's someone, Moise, who says, there's hope again. It's interesting to read articles everywhere from Esther Duflo from MIT, the Poverty Action Lab, to uh, The Economist had an article about the power of hope and about the importance of hope in investing in the future. So Moise is saying, little by little, uh, with the Lord's help, I'll get there. Anasita Zia said this, she said, I may be old, I may be blind, but I built my house and now rent out rooms. I will not beg. I will provide for my family. So again, this is an example. There is the material, but it also is the personal. As an 80-year-old Rwandan widow who has lost her sight, for her to stand tall, and, and again, I was with her, and she was not with her head down and her hand up, but she was someone who was standing tall. She was thinking about the future, and she was having the dignity of providing for her family. Just two more here. Um, uh, I can't uh, see the top of this, uh, but uh, the Lord has blessed us beyond what I ever hoped for. My most fervent dreams are no longer for myself. I want to be able to create jobs for others because I believe it is easier to lead individuals to Jesus Christ when their stomachs are not empty. Dolorosa uh, with our partner CCT in the Philippines. I love this because it is a business. She has a, uh, a taxi cab business, a sorry, sorry business. Uh, she is able to employ individuals, these little uh, uh, taxis in her community. And she's so excited. She's able to provide for herself, but it's beyond that. This is an example of the community, uh, the social impact, and on top of that, the spiritual. And I just, I've seen that as well. It's easier to lead individuals to Jesus Christ when their stomachs are not empty. And then last one, uh, Marilyn said this. She said, felt like I didn't have anything, but now I feel like I have everything. Not all the stories are like this. And even in these stories, sometimes there's more uh, transformation in one area. There's more spiritual transformation through the model of discipleship and advancing entrepreneurship in the places that we serve. But in each case, there's the possibility entrepreneurship has an essential way of contributing to true human flourishing, to unleashing God's grace in communities and impacting and restoring relationships that are broken, relationships with God, relationships with our self, relationships with our community and material restoration. But it's not just around the world uh, I believe that uh, one of the unlikely spokespeople for this sort of an approach is Bono. Bono said this, he says, commerce is real. Aid is just a stopgap. Commerce, entrepreneurial capitalism takes more people out of poverty than aid. If a rock star who's been known uh, to lobby governments for greater generosity is saying it, I hope that this message of the positive impact of commerce and entrepreneurship begins to take root 
um, another person, um, this is from the, the Gallup organization, George Gallup, and he's, George Clifton um, said this. He said, if countries fail at creating jobs, their societies will fall apart. So here, here's the question that we have. How can we help? How can we help people have a bigger mindset, a bigger vision of what entrepreneurship is? And to say we celebrate pastors, we celebrate missionaries, but we also want to celebrate entrepreneurs that are following Jesus, that are unleashing entrepreneurship around the world in our own communities, are recognizing that God has given a whole lot of gifts and abilities in our hands. And so our hope is that the ministry of Convene would continue to grow, would continue to flourish, and that there might even be a next generation of entrepreneurs that are thinking differently about the positive power, the positive impact of Christ-centered entrepreneurship. And that stories that we hear uh, around the world are stories that we want to celebrate here. Chris and I have kind of joked a little bit that when we go to conferences, very rarely is there the business person that is providing jobs and restoring relationships. Very rarely do they get to be on the center stage, and yet their stories and what entrepreneurs are doing around the world and in our own backyard is just incredible. Before Chris shares a few thoughts, I just want to close with one of my heroes. Uh, he is an entrepreneur uh, based out of Memphis, but Alan Barnhart, he and his wife, Catherine, started a co or took over the family business, have grown it. God has blessed it incredibly. And he is just as sold out as a kingdom entrepreneur as he would be if he was on the front lines. There's a great YouTube talk that he talks about the decision where he was trying to decide, do I go internationally? Do I go and join a missions organization or do I take over the family business? And, and what he decided and what many of you have decided is that there is incredible impact that we can have by following Christ right here, right now, as we love our employees, as we create value, as we point people to Christ, and as we love and serve our neighbors. And so we want to thank you. Uh, Alan is just one example of what so many of you are doing around uh, the country, and we're really thankful for Convene. So Chris, any, uh, any uh, comments that you would have here? Yeah, I just uh, wanted to, to close by saying this, that I, you know, Peter Open talking about the paradigm, which I'm sure many of you have wrestled with the sacred secular divide and this sort of pyramid of uh, professions based on God's blessing that missionaries are at the top and then, you know, pastors and then down, down the line doctors. And, and then at the very bottom, of course, business people. Um, but uh, what he also said is that missionaries are at the top. And the good news is that with the right view of theology and a the right view of God's word, we're all missionaries. Uh, we are all, ambassadors of our Lord and Savior in the places where God's called us. And so in your work, in leading, uh, managing uh, business businesses that, that God's called you to, you are missionaries. Uh, and I want to share just one story from Denver, uh, where I'm at, uh, of a business person who really came to terms with that. Um, it's a guy named James who I met a few years ago. He's uh, been someone who for the longest time has viewed his business as a means by which he can provide financially uh, for nonprofits. And that was sort of the purpose of his business. His dad started a pallet company. Uh, he took that pallet company over about 10 years ago and has been leading this business, 150 employees uh, leading this business in, in a way that's we're trying to maximize as much profits as we can so we can give money away. And God's really worked in his heart over the course of the last uh, 10 years to, to see that Actually, he's not just a missionary with his giving, but he's a missionary in the business that God's entrusted to him. And so he started to reimagine his business as part of what God has called him to do right now. And that in some ways, uh, the, the people that he's called to serve, his, uh, let's say his congregation, those in the, the community that he's called to be a missionary to, starts with his family and with 150 families that are working at his business. And so over the course of the last few years, he's had a total perspective shift. And now he started to focus on taking care of his employees. He used to have 100% employee turnover every year. And the last two years, he's only had a few people that have left the company because he started to treat his employees with dignity. He's also felt God calling him to serve the refugees in, in our community in Denver. And so he formed a partnership with the refugee agency. And now of the 150 employees, 60 of his employees are refugees uh, from Burma who are living here uh, in Denver. And so he's helping them get acclimated to society, uh, help to in invest in that community. He's doing English language classes. He's worked with 
uh, a, a chaplaincy service, and now he's got chaplains that are serving and providing emotional and spiritual care, uh, speaking the language of the, the Burmese refugees. He's partnered with local Burmese pastors, uh, nonprofits to help serve them and provide a really holistic experience for them. And so through that, he's still giving generously. He's still invested in his church, but he now has a new mission field that for a long time he just wasn't seeing. Uh, and God's using him in really incredible ways. And I often reflect, if someone told me that they are starting a nonprofit that's employing 60 Burmese refugees here in Denver, they're going to train them, they're going to do English language training, they're going to introduce them to Jesus, uh, they're going to help them become acclimated and become uh, effective um, uh, citizens of our city and of our country, uh, is that a nonprofit that I would give to? And I would say, absolutely. Not only that, but they're providing the best pallets that money can buy. Uh, these are great products that we all depend on, and everything that we buy comes and is shipped in to us by pallets. So if someone asked me to donate to that nonprofit, I would say, absolutely. That's a nonprofit I would give to. Uh, and that's the sort of exciting shift that I think is happening with a lot of Convene members, uh, with, with Christian business people who are starting to see their mandate as more than just being check writers, but as people that are joining the work that Hope is doing with entrepreneurs around the world, uh, they're doing it and modeling it themselves. Uh, they're modeling the, the whole life, the good life, in the ways that they're leading and serving their people. Uh, so I'll just wrap up by saying that uh, missionaries are absolutely the, the top of what God, uh, when God looks at his people, that is the top profession. And the great news is that we all are them. Uh, and that we're all called to be missionaries in the contexts and the places where he sent us. So Peter, I'll hand things back over to you maybe to facilitate a few questions. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you guys so much for sharing with us. And uh, there was one question that came through um, the asking about some books that uh, may be good on this topic. Uh, I know that you guys have an ebook that you provided to everyone um, prior to this, but if there were any other resources or books or things that uh, you thought uh, would fit this topic as well. Yeah, so we, we certainly are biased on this topic uh, in that we do have, we, can you hear Mark, Chris? Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. Um, yeah, so we certainly do have a, uh, a, a bias on this. We do have a book uh, that we've written, um, and it is called uh, Entrepreneurship for Human Flourishing. It is available uh, on Amazon, but it also is available for a free download as well. So if anyone would like that, hopefully you did get the link. If you didn't, feel free to send us uh, an email on that uh, as well, and we'll be happy to send that to you. Um, the exciting thing, I, I think there is a growing sense of um, – of, of uh, books on this. This is putting me on the spot. Chris. I have, I have two quick recommendations. Yeah. Uh, so two, two thoughts. One Peter mentioned earlier, but The Coming Jobs War uh, by Jim Clifton. Uh, this looks at sort of the, the global landscape of jobs and both the importance of good jobs and the, the coming shortage of good jobs. Uh, so that's a great one to get a global perspective. And then I think one that's really fascinating, it's not written from a Christian perspective, uh, but really uh, comes at it from a different angle is the book called Conscious Capitalism uh, by John Mackey, the founder and CEO of Whole Foods, who actually started uh, Whole Foods as a nonprofit co-op, uh, food co-op, and then transitioned into leading the Whole Foods that we know today. Uh, and he has a sort of pseudo-Buddhism uh, that he ascribes to that you can read about in the book. So just know that going in, that's his perspective. But the whole book, I would say, just provides a really fascinating look at the way in which business plays such a central role in making societies work. Uh, so that would be my recommendation if you're looking for a sort of an industry standard book that provides a really interesting perspective on, um, yeah, on and the importance of good jobs. And then uh, Joseph uh, asked the question, uh, I am an executive coach. How would you see that fitting? How would you see that being helpful in this uh, circumstance? So how would an executive coach promote entrepreneurship uh, for human flourishing? Yeah, you know, I, I'd, I'd love to hear more um, from Joseph, but uh, in my mind, an executive coach, what a great opportunity to come alongside uh, uh, executives and to help them understand their calling um, and to think creatively about the full uh, impact that they could have uh, 
you've got to run great companies. You've got to run successful companies. Um, and you've got to take care of employees in a creative way to really enable flourishing. And so I think a coaching role uh, would just be tremendously helpful uh, in helping people perhaps think a little bit differently, a little more broadly about the impact that they can have on their full supply chain, as well uh, as the people that surround them each and every day. So I don't know, I, I, it sounds like a tremendous way to have an impact. Gotcha. And I, I'll just add one thing that uh, I didn't share this, but James had an executive coach and a group, a peer group around him that helped him to sort of rediscover the, the, the latent opportunity in his midst at his pallet company. Uh, it was because of a group of people and an executive coach that helped him to, to sort of revision his company that he went from viewing it as a, like a necessary evil and a means to an end, something that in, in itself inherently uh, had such opportunity and potential. And if you asked him today how things are going, he would say he's never been having more fun in his business um, than he is right now. So I, I do think what an important role to help uh, CEOs, business owners, business leaders to re sort of reimagine their work uh, than someone that's in that sort of position. Thank you. That's awesome. Thank you so much uh, to Peter and Chris, and thank you all for joining us. Uh, I'd just like to take a moment and uh, end in prayer, um, but I just want to thank you two gentlemen very much for sharing with us today, and uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, we know that you created work, and you created work uh, that is good, and uh, Father, we, we thank you for two, these two men who have come and uh, presented a way to uh, think about entrepreneurship in a way that um, allows us to engage with um, how it can actually help not just in, in this country, like how we can use businesses in this country and businesses overseas and businesses all around the world, not only to um, gain in business acumen, but also, Father, to impact the world for you. Uh, Father, and have true impact. Um, I go back to that quote about how aid is not actually going to last uh, for these countries and, and, and make a significant impact, but entrepreneurship can bring about the human flourishing that uh, these countries need and can provide and can can lead them to, towards you, Father. And so I just want to take a moment to thank you for Peter and Chris. Thank you for Hope International and what you are doing in their lives. And thank you for all the businesses uh, that are out there spreading your word by doing good work, Father. Uh, we just come before you and thank you for this time and pray uh, that all of us would have a great rest of our day glorifying you in the work that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a great weekend. <laughs>